about the paddle and I am really looking forward to this. So don't forget, send your questions through and I hope you really enjoy this. So over to you, Steve. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, good evening, everybody, uh, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. I'm sure you've got different time zones for, for everybody. Um, and that's Friday, so the weekend's coming, which is a great thing. Look, uh, yeah, the paddles. Um, uh, yeah, kind of a misunderstood animal sometimes, but I, what I'd like to do this evening is really just focus down on some of the key issues about paddles and obviously stress the importance of them, and that's really the, the whole thrust of the, of the evening. And as Chris says, we don't have a lot of time, so you know, one hour to just talk about paddles is, um, is a short time. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I've, I've been lucky enough to actually help with design paddles in the past, uh, specifically with our canoeing, recent, more recently with stand-up. Um, and I've even made my own paddles in the past, which has always been a challenge, but it'd be interesting to do so using timber primarily. But even in that process, you learn an awful lot about what, what works and what doesn't work. So, you know, what, what I like to do this evening too is cover um, myths, uh, you know, the mythology behind some of the things that we've heard and there's certain sort of cliched expressions which I want to address as well because we need to be, take stock of those and just see how much validity there is behind them. So um, I'm just going to move right along and um, so, you know, this, this statement here, the, the relationship that you form with your paddle must be so as you are totally at ease with the nuances of how it feels in the water and in the air as you wield it as an extension of yourself. You know, think of a, if you were a warrior with a, you know, with a sword, you know, you've got a much better chance if you've got a well-designed sword as against one that's just not fit for purpose. Um, and, you know, when you're on the water and you're swinging this thing around and you're on the water for extended periods of time, you do form a very close relationship with it. It absolutely is an extension of yourself. The issue is, you know, how good of an extension of yourself is it? I mean, does it talk to you or is it absolutely dead in the water? If it's not speaking to you, then in some way you could say that in actual fact, you know, this is not um, a tool that's really doing you any favors. And this is the rub. This is the thing that we need to knuckle down and really consider strongly. Um, and then it just applies to all paddle sports. It's not just a stand-up paddle board. It doesn't matter what, whether from kayak to canoe to stand up, the, the uh, approach towards, sub, uh, towards, towards paddle ownership is always the same. So that's just a, you know, gives you an idea of where you reach, how, just how important you should be looking at this, uh, th this implement. You know, a good one, I just want you sort of, for you to really consider the paddle too. You know, it's, it's iconoclastic, it's symbolic. Um, what I mean by that? I mean that there are cultures around the world that would view the, 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 the paddle as the symbology of the paddle in the way someone might view a cross, you know, for example. I know that sounds extreme, but actually it's not far from the truth. By that, you know, if you consider the cultures of Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia, you know, they are canoeing cultures and the paddle is that motor trans helps them with the, that transportation, the motor transportation, the propulsion rather than that they need. So, you know, this is not an insignificant um, uh, piece of equipment that's been around for thousands of years. Anecdotes, I just want to give you a quick anecdote, you know, this extension of yourself, you know, for example, I remember some years ago, I was with a very good close friend of mine, uh, Chris Kjelson. We'd flown, we were coming back from Hawaii. We stopped in the Cook Islands. We landed and we, we burst a, uh, some hydraulics on, on landing and rather than stay in the airplane, everyone had to get out and we needed to spend 24 hours there. Well, in that process, stood in the airport, I'm standing there with a paddle, a bunch of paddles. You know, the next minute you've got uh, random strangers coming up to you who are Cook Islanders saying, hey, hey, you paddle, you paddle canoe, you know, and next thing we've got a conversation, next thing, we left the building, went outside, and we paddled after in the lagoon and had a great time. These folks came back the next day and got on a plane and flew home. And, you know, I think the point here is that, you know, it's a, almost like an international symbol. If you've got this paddle and you, you travel with this paddle. Um, it, it's, it's expression of who you are, expression of what you do, what you'd rather be doing. So it's a powerful thing. Um, uh, but let's make sure we get caught with a nice paddle in the airport, not, so, not, 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 not such a good one. <laughs> so. Moving on from there, I'm going to roll through this quite quickly and we will get some really meaty stuff and some controversial stuff in a moment, but paddle anatomy, you know, you need to understand the anatomy of a paddle I and mean, every component of it from the grip at the very top, you know, from the grip at the t from the top of it all the way down to the tip of it. 
you know, so you've got the, and the grip, the grip comes in different shapes and different sizes and different forms. I'll show you those in a minute. Um, but the shaft is also called the loom. Okay, uh, the throat, throat area is around, the, that's the area in which you actually put your, your lower hand around, you grasp it, and how that feels is, is important. It's integral to the, your connection with, with, with the paddle, and as, as is the grip. Those things, they're very tactile. If it's uncomfortable anywhere, if it doesn't work for you, that's, that's an immediate issue. So that's something you'd be you know, switched on to and aware. Um, the throat area, is it too, is the diameter too much or too little? Are you having to squeeze to control it or not? Is it around or is it oval? You know, these are all little micromanagement details that actually do make a difference in the long run. We have what's called the compression side of the, of the shaft. So in other words, the, sh the, 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 the side that's being uh, bent. So if you were to find paddling and I'm pushing this way, this would be the compression side because as it, as it flexes, this, the, all this stuff side gets, actually gets crushed and the other side stretches. Why is that important? Well, it's important from the point of view of looking for stretch fractures. It's important from the point of view of flex and how, they, how these paddles are made. And um, it's, not, it's not insignificant. Um, going all the way down to the blade itself, you've got the shoulders, you know, so if I take an example here, okay, so you, the, the, here's the neck. Okay, the neck which joins onto the shaft itself, runs into the shoulders. Okay, well, analogy for, for ourselves. Okay, and the shoulders just got the, the side edges, if you like, pretty straightforward. Then you go around into the tip area. Okay, on the blade itself, you've got, you can just see a dihedral on here. This is a little raised dihedral. Okay, that's to prevent fluttering. So the water, water can actually exit left and right. You have equal portions either side to, so you, to prevent this sort of motion, which is a fluttering. You know, so that, that there are many little things to consider. So this is, you know, this is th this side here is the is actually the uh, this is the back side. This is the low pressure side. This is actually the front of the blade, even though you might think it's the back, but it isn't. It's the front. This is the compression side that does the work. Again, not unimportant. Just to know these little micro and neat details here, and to understand what parts your paddle are doing what exactly. And of course, the design, the shape of these templates are, are essential, you know, how, in terms of how they work. And we'll get on to blade area and stuff in a moment, concaves and so forth. So, you know, this paddle, it gets that shaped. There are thousands of templates lying out there from, you know, bespoke specialist people who have been designing paddles for years, all the way to Alibaba.com in factories in China, where there are just hundreds and hundreds of these templates lying around. They just grab one off the shelf and produce them and chuck them out the door. And then hopefully the marketing department can somehow or other justify their existence to tell you wow this is the greatest best since this bottled beer but actually is it so you know again for all, arm yourself with knowledge about the paddle itself learn the anatomies learn all the little bit the little all little bits of it from the top to the bottom it's very important um now shoulders the shoulder of the paddle is quite critical so you've got there's uh, there's a few examples here of, of, diff of different paddles with different shoulders um now, what's really interesting about shoulders is that a, 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 a paddle or a blade that's got a lot of shoulder, a, a big shoulder sort of extension on it, this would even be considered to have quite a, quite a large shoulder on it, okay? What you can do with this is that when you're paddling, when you're pulling down the side of the, the board or the canoe, whatever it might be, it conforms to the, the shape or the, the rail. So it's, it's, it conforms, so it can actually wrap around, you know, this was the, the board itself okay the rail would conform to the to the shoulder that means that part of the blade actually travels underneath the board to some extent or the canoe and the theory behind that years ago and it's, it's true today is it actually creates dirty water underneath the board so it breaks the connection it, it breaks up the surface tension so actually there is a valid reason for it being there it's not just some random concept that we just you know, it looks nice so we can call it a teardrop it was actually put there for a reason now if you look at for example the kialoa here it's got very straight shoulders. It's very, it's, well, in fact, it's shoulderless to be fair. It's just straight down. So it's a different sort of approach. Whereas the, the ZRE here, or even the, this, the C4 blade, they've got more pronounced shoulders. But this ZRE mostly uh, is, the mo is the most dramatic example. So that's not important, unimportant. That needs to be considered. How much shape is there? How much, how much shoulder is built into your, to the paddle that you're gonna buy? And it, does it suit your paddling style? Um, grips. I've had questions about grips in the past, you know, so for example, if you can see that, 
Okay, this is a palm grip. Okay, a palm grip, basically the idea is that you know, it sits in the palm, fingers wrap over the top, and the idea is that, you know, you've got some good, you've got a flat spot there for the fingers and you've got a good connection. Um, they are, they're excellent, but for, for really what sort of rough water or white water stuff, paddling, uh, for example, there is a, there is, can be a tendency to slide off of it. So they're positive, but not as positive as say a T grip. So a T grip would be far more basic. It's very, very rudimentary. A T grip is more like this, you know, very rudimentary shape. It literally is, you know, just meat and potatoes. It's just basic, you know, but it does the job. You can really hang on to that. Then you've got another option, which is a hammerhead. And a hammerhead is actually a variant. You know, it's sort of, it's actually flat on one side and it's got the roundness on the, on the, on the, at the back. So it's a little bit like uh, the palm grip, but not quite as fancy, okay? Because it's, it's just square and it's a bit like a T, it's somewhere between a T grip and a, uh, and, and a palm grip. So that's the hammerhead. It's a nice compromise actually, you know, very, very popular in, in our canoeing circles. You do see it in stand-up as well. So why are they important to know? Because, you know, that does make a big difference, a big difference in terms of you know, that, that tactile and that feel, you know, that control and how big your hand is and that does it sit well. I mean, some people paddling it bruising, they literally feel bruised in the top hand because it's not comfortable. So again, you know, when you're looking at your paddles, which one is going to suit you, that's another micromanagement detail that's not insignificant. Any questions, Chris? Can I just keep on going? You're good? Um. Well, we, we've got a question already, which is regarding um, wrist injuries and issues. I don't know whether you wish to cover that a little bit later on, Steve, because um, I'm, I'm sure we'll get quite a few questions regarding, you know, I've got a sore uh, wrist, yeah. shoulder, or so, so I don't know if you plan to cover that later or... Well, that, question now. Um, yeah, that's fine. I mean, it, I think you know. It, it, well, ask the question. What have? Okay, so it comes from Owen. Owen said he's got a, a wrist issue and he's working with a physio at the minute, yeah. and he's asking them, um, would it help his um, his recovery if he used to work with a smaller blade designed for a higher cadence? Right. Um, okay. 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 Yeah. Um, uh, Yes, possibly. It really depends on a number of factors. And I will get to blade sizes and areas in, in a moment. Um, but the other thing is, that with, with what he will probably find is, I expect, it, it depends, he probably, with the wrist, he's probably got, he, he might find with the top hand, when, he's, when it's, the injured wrist is at the top, it might hurt. And when it's down the bottom, it doesn't hurt, or vice versa, or it might hurt wherever it is, top and lower. That's not insignificant, again, because it, it that, tells you a lot about, you know, is it the pulling motion with the lower hand that's causing the pain or is it the upper, upper load? Because the hands do different things. So the top hand is loading, it's, if you're doing it correctly, it's loading downwards more than it's going forwards, obviously. And the lower hand is pulling, so it's more off, you know, it's more coming from the, from the lats and the top of the back and so forth. So it's a different kind of motion. But compression, if compression is the, is, is the problem, you know, um, a smaller blade, yes, would probably help to some degree, especially at the entry and as you're getting lift with the blade. You could try not perhaps pushing the blade in quite such in, in so sort of reaching as far as you would normally compromise the reach a little bit so you can work through it. Um, the smaller blade, as I say, would, would take some of that pressure and that load away. Um, the other thing is to do, if it was the top hand hurting, which, which it tends to be, um, the other way is to look to look at look at the grips. You know, um, some grips are better suited for for driving down than others. Um, so the hammerhead is quite good for that, and the palm's quite good, but the T grip's not quite so good. So depending on the shape, you need to look at that and, and do some research and you know see what what's going to work for you best. But that would be my main question, knowing the difference, because I know that you know I've had some wrist issues in the past, and driving down is the one that hurts more than the pulling. Pulling never seemed to be an issue, but the driving down definitely does. So, um, in short, yes, that could help. Remember, though, if you get under a smaller blade, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have less effort, and you you have to pull that you pull less. And in fact, you have to pull a little bit harder with a small blade to get the same result but it's a it's a different it's a different energy system and your heart your stroke rate is going to increase so you can still use the big paddle but you've got to slow everything down a little bit just not be so aggressive so 
hope that sort of helps. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, it was quite a pertinent question. Um, since we've been just talking about grips, I'm sure that will make a difference if uh, Owen can um, try it, muck around with some different different grips as well. Um, yeah. Other questions that's come in, Steve, while we're while we're talking about the subject, you've got a picture on the screen, you know, with your templates, and you were talking about the shoulders. And um, Paul's asking, what's the benefit of the shoulderless Kia lower paddle if the others break surface tension? Yeah, good question. Well, of course, you, it's, it creates a slightly higher aspect paddle. So, in other words, you know, instead of lo instead of putting all your 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 uh, concentrated effort and, and, and your your surface area uh, in a more concentrated area, um, you know, you've where the power is sort of dead center. Uh, with the key lower, it's going to sit a little higher. So it's a little it's a little higher aspect. And of course, you start going into higher and higher, narrower and taller paddles it becomes even more so that center effort moves, moves ever taller the, the the teardrop shape with the keel lower is a fairly yeah you know, it's, it's 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 very much for our it was, primarily was designed for our rig canoeing although it was it did exist in in river river paddling prior anyway but um and, and in fact the zeroe is, is actually a refined version of those original sort of teardrop paddles to take you to another level in having those those curvatures so you can connect with the rails and get underneath the underneath the canoe the so it does the kilo allows you a, you can get a bigger blade area and it's more progressive effectively um, the other thing is with the the low center of effort with the zeroe you know this is a paddle that is quite requires a lot of explosive uh, energy in terms of its use um, you can't because it isn't progressive. It's kind of all or nothing. Whereas the keel lower is more sort of you can be you can be more progressive in terms of you know you don't have to bury all of it, but you need to bury most of it in order for it to be effective. So the other thing is that with those those paddles, they make quite good rough water paddles. So that you know when you're if you're pitching and moving up and down all the time, you've got that that uh, you know that 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 height you can play with. Whereas a short paddle, if you if you if you if you miss a stroke and it's not an uncommon pass in very rough order to almost miss one because you, because of the pitching going on, you know it's that's it's 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 so it compensates for that you know this the, the shape the kilo so that is kind of where the the, the differences come but zellerie definitely is a refined version for and really came out of river paddling to be fair and and, and some some degree then they use it in um, some ra in rapid paddling as well but they are seated. Um, as a stand-up paddle, um, what we're learning now is that actually the taller paddles are a little bit more, generally more effective, to be fair, and more and, and high aspect. So I think that's where we get a little bit. This is where we're seeing the evolution of stand-up paddle boarding and the equipment that we're using. You know, we're getting away from you know short, dumpy paddles that look to taller and narrower, seeing that as a, as a better as a better solution. Um, so I hope that kind of helps a little bit. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Steve. Um, I'm just mindful of uh, time's already flying by. Um, yep. and the questions are flying in. So uh, just finally, one more question um, Michelle's asking, and I could vouch for this, be it based in the UK as well. Um, why is it that tea and hammerhead grips uh, seem to be more difficult to come by and part in the UK, especially in palm grips, seem to be the go-to one that you know, most, you know, m most of the paddles that are supplied that I've experienced actually come with the palm grip as well. So. Mm, mm. Well, I think this is, um, you know, the palm grip is, is, is designed for comfort uh, largely. And um, I think also that, you know, again, this is just one of these micromanagement de de details. You know, it's not, the, the companies that are designing are sort of, they do get a little bit focused on the, on the lower end of the paddle and not so much on the upper end of the paddle. And it seems to be convenient just to churn those out. When in reality, you know, you should be able to order a paddle and specify, I want T-grip, palm grip, hammerhead. Why not? Hell, they should even be interchangeable, you know, um, perhaps for different scenarios, because there are, there are situations where you might want to use the T-grip because it's very wet and, you know, it's just you know, for one particular reason in the water. And on other days, it's hot and dry. You don't want that. You need something more like palm grip. It's more comforting or, or even better, go to the... the the hammerhead now the hammerhead to me still is one of the best shapes you can use it's a really comfortable shape when you use the palm there's always that potential for boom you know and i've seen broken noses you know i've seen several broken noses i've seen cut eyes i've even smashed myself in the in the face in fact we used to wear 
it's quite common to wear peak caps with really high, you know, strong plastic visors. So if it hits, if you slide off, it'll hit the, hit the peak right and hit you in the face. So yes, why? I, I can't really answer that, but I, I have a great suspicion that it's just, a, it does come down to, and I don't mean to be cynical, but the truth is that a lot of these uh, factories in China, that's just simply what they've got lying around. They're not necessarily offering anything else. And that, that's a, a reality. And, and actually the, 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 the brands aren't necessarily putting pressure on them to make anything different. So I think that's kind of the honest, the honest truth of it, to be fair. But I would like to see more, more of ham heads for sure. They're, they're a great, a great shape. Yeah, thanks for that. I'd like to try one. I've not actually tried one myself, so um, yeah. hopefully we will be, get to see some. So thanks for that, Steve. Um, I think probably best to move on now. Yeah, okay. So this is going to get lively now. So um, <laughs> you see, this is the, uh, we're talking about paddles. We're talking about, you know, by investing in a good paddle and uh, why that's important. So, you know, for me personally, the problem begins with the retailer who is very overly sort of, zealous and trying to sell you a, a board at any cost and the buyer knows no better and you know the reality is that you know they're not not doing any favors so i've got this buy beware of the free paddle for example so you know uh free state set of steak knives with every whatever you know um it, you've got to as a, i feel sorry for those walking to stores because uh, with no knowledge of paddle of stout paddle sports at all because they're really uh, lambs to the slaughter they walk in uh, they themselves are sort of all kept, kept caught up in the idea of buying the board but the board is which is absolutely fine but of course it's really up to the retailer to slow the buying process process down and after you quiz them about what their budget is you then have to say well the most thing you really need to do is let's budget for the paddle first and then we'll consider the board kind of secondary but it's never that way and it's even worse than that because they'll empty out your pockets for all of, for the board and then they'll throw in a supposedly free paddle and you need to think about that long and hard because if you know if it's free how just how good is it and once you understand how important the paddle is as an extension of you and as a tool if that is a poor inferior tool the net result is a pretty poor outcome. It wouldn't matter all the money in the world you can you can spend. I you can spend the, the best money on the best board in the world, and you, you can then you go and paddle it with a piece of heavy industrial dross, and you will just rue the day you ever you ever spent all that money on the board because you've got to have a good paddle. It's just it's it's you know I say it's ma it's mandatory, but. The point is that you know it's not it's it is that important it really is it can be the difference between you're enjoying this sport and absolutely loathing it and it can also be the difference between my lips moving and telling you how to paddle you know, if you listen to other uh, webinars we've done we can talk about paddling technique till, till the cows come home but if you've got the wrong tool that's very heavy and does all the wrong things and actually uh, you can't implement correct technique as hard as you try it just will not work so you know, become superfluous. So, you know, re this is where retailers need to be far more honest. And you know, you know, and you know, selling a paddle is actually an easy sell compared to a board. I mean, it really is. Yeah, so it's not so much money, but you've got to put focus on that. It's really, really critical. Um, when I started, when I came over here about ten years ago and started getting involved, it's sort of sharing my knowledge with people. And people were just getting in the stand-up paddleboarding industry and selling. You know, they they hadn't even given any thought to the paddle. They just thought it was completely secondary. It's like sell, sell, sell boards, but the paddle was almost like it was just a secondary consideration. Therefore, it's just a you know have a freebie. Here's one for thirty pounds. It's fantastic. Which you know brings me to this. I mean, this is an actual pitch, you know, from an actual store in this country that sells lots of boards. So they would say, for example, that you know. Yes, they say that budget's often a consideration, which means for many people, you're gonna to have to buy an alloy paddle. Have to, I mean, since when? Um, and alloy paddles, that they actually quote, they say they're good, solid, and durable. Well, so is a central tunnel support, but that's what it's designed for. But when it comes to paddling, <laughs> you need something that's gonna be a bit more, you know, amiable and, and you can form a relationship. It's gonna give you what, you know, the experience you need. 
And they, they say our packages come with at least one good quality sub pa uh, alloy paddle. Well, of course it does, because it's practically free and it costs about five quid, 10 quid from a Chinese factory. So what do they care? You know, but they should care because actually they have a duty of care to make sure you enjoy your paddling experience, you know? So all the money they extract out of you for the board is all well and good, but they've already done you a disservice. You know, it, it's just, you've got to be arm yourself. And some of you out there will be listening this evening. You, you've probably possibly been there through that situation. Others of you already know, and you, you, you've probably bought your way up to the better paddle. And you start adding up all the money you've ever spent on, on getting to where you are now. Some of you probably have spent a thousand pounds or close to it because you've over time gotten there when you should have done that a long time ago and saved yourself a lot of money. Notwithstanding that carbon, pretty good quality carbon paddles are actually, they hold their value very well. Yeah, they, they really do. You go to sell one after a few years and as you looked after it, the thing is practically new. Whereas you can't say that was a, as a board, they depreciate massively. So that's just something to consider. This is an actual ad here promoting stable, powerful stroke pat blade style. And they're talking about the fact that it's got a dual concave blade face with dihedral angle creating speed and drive and lift. Well, actually it's heavy, it's clumsy, it's cheap. The concave blade face they're talking about is on the wrong side. It's actually completely the wrong way. They're talking about the, the, uh, you know, the back face, not the power face. So that's just completely, you know, but this is the anti paddle, the little pull paddle is off basically. Um, so it does come down to a question of money and there's all sorts of paddles on the market, all different combinations. You know, there's a whole list there of different things you can, you, know, you can combine everything, but all these, all these, all these, uh, sharp blade and um, blade core com uh, sort of combinations are all just a way to avoid the hard truth. That is, that, you know, especially in stand up paddle boarding, we've got such a long lever arm, um, that the carbon paddle still wins out pretty much well it does all the time let's be fair it does so everything else is a compromise you know whether you're using fiberglass whether you're using some molded plastic polycarbonate whether you're using alloy or carbon kevlar mixes or no matter what carbon though will always have a certain amount of fiberglass or something in it especially in the shaft because it needs to have some flex so there are different amounts of that put into it to make sure it does flex you don't want to paddle with iron bars so that's that's another thing to be clear about you know they will come with different percentages of, of grp or fiberglass and carbon nevertheless that's just how it is and of course it all depends on on this question of affordability but can, the question i would say is can you afford not to if you are even remotely serious about um having a good time on the water um so you know again there's all these arguments you know many uh, you know some people say well there are thousands of budget paddles on the water and they work just fine but what does that mean adequate are they, are they adequate well if you want an adequate experience go ahead you know <laughs> that's really the reality of it um but as i say one of the thrust of this what i'm trying to get through to everybody is that you know the paddle is a, is a basically what well, is an extension of you a tool and it's absolutely essential that you can uh, form a relationship with it and use it you know, in, in a very, though we have gross motor movements to, to, to swing the paddle, there are a lot of micromanagement details going on at the same time. So in that respect, the actual paddle is quite um, uh, a re refined tool. And of course, the better, the more refined it is, the, the more it will give you what you want and speak to you. So yeah, I've got these, all these things here about, you know, um, well, exactly what cheaper so, so there's no point having a budget board and using expensive carbon blades it won't add to the standard paddle boarding experience well, of course that's complete nonsense that isn't as isn't so at all um because really if you have it doesn't matter what sort of board you have if you have a pad, bad paddle you have a, you're gonna have a bad experience regardless but it's just that's just how it is you've got to have the good paddle to get you know to get the best out of the board so all these things are all relative, you know, um, but certainly uh, heavy, a heavy paddle doesn't work so well. It's going to slow the learning process, reduce your experience and keep early fatigue, possibly injuries and a whole bunch of other things. So there are, they are things to not, not dis uh, dismiss. I'm going to come back to blade paddles now. And here's a good one. So uh, right now um, a blade area or size, if you like, has become for me the biggest single subject of ignorance in relation to paddle knowledge I can imagine. It's just in some of the quotes that I hear, I'm like, really, you know. So here's a good one. Um, I'm just going to move this down here a little bit. So, you know, 
So, so this is actually a quote from a well-known guy, and you know, I respect him greatly, but it hasn't helped uh, some, to be fair. So the size of a stand-up paddle was blade can be compared directly on, to gears on a bike. Uh, you've probably read that, maybe. Um, the higher or the smaller the blade, the less effort each stroke requires with less forward motion generated. Well, as I say here, I'm sure the world's fastest paddles will be pleased to inform this as a guy laughing his head off because that's just complete nonsense. Um, just because the blade is smaller does not mean you, it requires less effort to pull it. It does not mean you will go slowly. It just doesn't work like that you, because you, you work on different energy systems to make, you, to, to make use of this small paddle. There's very good reasons why you want to go use a small paddle. We'll go for the smallest you can. So I've written here that you know the use of a small blade requires speed. By speed, I mean when you place the paddle in the water, as you place and get the catch, you want speed in terms of acceleration to get get through the catch to the pull phase, because you want to anchor that blade uh, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Now, if you pull slowly, all the water is going to spill off it. You're not going to achieve that. So you, it's, it requires a slightly was a, a definitely a more aggressive um, stroking technique to to, to use it requires a slightly different energy system to use it to get it okay so they're important to, to consider the other thing is that there's only one type of station you're anchoring so what i mean by that whether you anchor a small blade in the water because the idea is you pull yourself up to the paddle right so if you anchor a big blade or a small blade if it's anchored it's anchored it's stationary it makes the difference are you with me it doesn't have to be huge have to be, or it could be small, as long as it's not moving, it's done its job. So anything bigger than that is surplus to requirements, which is just actually drag. And that's, that's why the big paddles can become quite hard to use in, in many respects, because they, they end up causing more drag, uh, they often are heavier, and they're just more cumbersome, so they actually they'll suck the energy out of you. So there are reasons to sort of work progressively towards the, the smaller paddle. Um, how are we going, Chris? Yeah, all good. Um, I'm going to come on to blade and size area. And yep. yep. Yeah. I mean, just, give, just give an example. Like, so if you, if you know about rowing, the, growing, the concept to rowing machines, you know, so when you have a con, when in, a, in a competition set, set up, you, ha, you can set the resistance, what level, level suits you best. You can set the resistance so, the, so that when you pull, it's very hard to make the wheel and the internal uh, mechanism spin, or you can set it very, very light. And that's really significant. It's significant because the each individual selects what they want. Now, just because the light the the light pattern may have said he wants a light setting on the concept too, as long as he if he pulls it with great gusto, or if, whether he's you use a paddling ergo for example, you have a single single blade. If he really pulls it hard, he can generate so much spin in there that he can actually have the same stroke rate as a guy with the with a much higher setting or heavier setting, and it can be with every stroke covering more distance. So these arguments about gears and stuff, you know, it's a bit, it's all a little bit random to be honest, and it's not necessarily at all a good a good analogy. There are other ones that might be a little better. Um, so. But that's something not to dismiss. Here's one like so powerful. Now I'm just moving on to slippage, for example, with blades and how much blade area you need. So powerful cars of any weight require wider tires, okay? Because when they when you put the foot down on the on the on the on the accelerator, they've got so much power, the wheel spin. And that analogy was the same with powerful paddlers. If you've got really powerful paddlers, especially they're heavy, when they pull. Uh, hard on their blade, if the blade is too small, the blade, blade effectively cavitates, it moves through the water, which is not what you want. Instead of anchoring, it moves. So that, that's the, the signal for them to consider they need a slightly bigger, uh, they need to sort of consider what the, you know, you need to suit the, 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 the size of the blade to that power, which is the same as, you know, I was saying in cars and is similar sort of uh, thing because it's all about traction, you know, and it's all about where the paddle's all about getting that anchoring going on. So it's a not, not a dissimilar concept. Um, so moving right along, if you talk about blade, uh, if you talk about, so here's, here's a statement. So if it's possible for two paddles, one one on a small, or a smaller blade, and one with a larger blade to be traveling at the same speed. And, you have, and someone says, well, how is that possible? And you say, well, 
because the guy with the small blade is actually carrying a higher stroke rate. Well, not necessarily, because you can have two people, one with a large blade area and one with a small one, paddling side by side with the same cadence, the same stroke rate, and they're going the same speed. And it's because, uh, you know, the, the guy, and he, they're not, he, has, he isn't going rating any faster, the guy with the small paddle, but it's simply that he's just able to generate uh, greater power for, the, for, a, for a smaller amount of blade area, but he's still creating the, making sure the blade is stationary at, at, at when he needs to, just as perhaps the chap is with the, the, the big blade, but he might be a heavier person with more mass. And because of that, that's working against him, you know, or her. So that's not accurate, that statement, for example. Um, cadence means high or low numbers of revolution, high or low paddle stroke rates. If you go at this over distance of, say, a couple of miles, someone on to, who has a large blade would tire quickly, whereas if they were on a smaller one, correct size blade, they would be well matched to cover distance. Well, again, that's not necessarily true at all. It really, it all comes down to your glide rate, it comes down to your mass, your size, and a whole bunch of things. So it's not, again, you have to be very careful that sort of misinformation because these are generalities and they're not they're, they're assuming everyone is the same and that's again incorrect um so it really depends stroke rates really depend on person's physiology and the size of that paddle is going to matter so in other words if you are a bigger stronger guy or girl you may want to go to slightly you, you may have to you, you go to the to the larger blade because otherwise you've got slippage but your, your idea your goal is come down down and down down in size to the smallest blade you can possibly get away with not the biggest okay and as i quoted here you know most all paddlers all all the top paddlers in the world all aim to use the smallest blade here they're not looking for the biggest the biggest is is just drag and it's excess they don't need that excess they want to skinny it down to to efficiency it also allows them to go up in stroke rate if they need to the trouble with the big blade is you're limited. You don't, you can only, you're, you're limited to your strokes per minute, whereas with the small paddle, you've got options to some degree. You can, you can still you know, plant the paddle, put a lot of power into it, get the anchoring you need, and still have a quite a slow stroke rate and be very efficient. You know, so that's absolutely possible, but it's all about becoming you know, attuned to this tool that you're using and getting, becoming a better paddler and using yourself as an extension of it. So again, a lot of misinformation in terms of blade sizes and stroke rates and so forth. I mean, stroke rates, if you're paddling downwind, your stroke rates generally are going to be a lot higher because you've got to, if you, because the board's already moving fast at times, if you put the paddle in the water, you've got to pull faster than the water's traveling beside you on past you. Otherwise you're not going to make any connection. So that's just an obvious, when you turn around and go upwind, all the rules change because when you got up when everything slows down, you know, and there was this thing some years ago, again, the famous guy was saying, you know, when you go down, when you need much bigger blade area, and when you got, and when you got, and you know, when you got, when probably the other way around, but that's again, not how we've done things. Certainly not in our area. We've actually go smaller blades for downwind because we want high cadence. Um, and there's less resistance. Whereas you go upwind, you kind of need the bigger blade. You need the bigger blade because you can get slippage with a small blade because there's more drag. So the, it's fuzzy logic, you've got, to, you've got to flip around, you know, so that's really not unimportant um, in terms of your thinking. Um, I think, Steve, um, the problem that a lot of us have is, you know, we just can't walk out the door and buy a paddle each and every week um, and to try these things. And wouldn't it be so beneficial if there were more opportunities really for for us paddlers to get out and try different paddles. More industry demo days, I think, would be really, really useful, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of opportunity mm. for a lot of people other than possibly a, at a race or having a try of something different. Mm. So, if, you know, if we could influence in any way, I, and I know, I, you know I'm not going on a big plug now, but WSA, we have that, uh, our symposium coming up in October where we will have a lot of retailers there and people will get the opportunity to try um, many different paddles. So if, if you are able to attend that audience, that would be fantastic. Um, if you're not, well, it's, it's a little bit difficult, isn't it, for us to get and try these different paddles? Yeah, but and again, you know, again, this is down to, the, down to retailers and sellers, you know, or even websites, you know, you've got, you've had it, calculating your blade size is, is a factor of many things you know it's going to be your body weight your mass it's going to be your strength basically your age i mean uh, 
that can be absolutely a factor. Um, your, your twitch muscle, you fast, you slow, what sort of paddling do you want to do? Are you spray your sprinter, a long distance cruiser, you're in the surf, you're downwinding. I mean, all these questions are not insignificant. And, you know, if you, if you answered all those questions, you know, within an app, an application of some sort that, that had the you know, algorithms that could work it all out for you, that would be, you know, it'd be nice on a website. <laughs> it wouldn't be necessarily, even that would be conclusive. You still would come and use it. But yes, I agree. You've got to get it. You know, you've got to go out there and um, and experiment. But again, it comes down to this idea of having a quiver of paddles. The very idea of having one paddle that's going to do it all for you is again. You know, I know you might be on a budget, but ultimately you've got to go out there and buy second hand or beg, borrow, scrounge, and 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 uh, you know just have a re bit of a re revelation to yourself. It's not until you do try different sticks you'll get you'll get a, a better idea of um, what suits you for different weather conditions or water conditions or race conditions or you know fresh water salt water i mean that's how picky you get i mean if you go to if you go to extremes you know there is difference between salt water and fresh water and i'm going crazy now but i mean that that's not insignificant to some extent certainly is in terms of volume of boards and volumes of canoes and and things and i know that's something we've dealt we've dabbled with over the years with with canoeing but um there's about a three percent um, extra buoyancy say in salt water than there is in fresh um, there are there are differences, but anyway, that's just getting a bit ahead of myself. But you know, yes, I agree with you, Chris. It's, you know, people aren't getting enough uh, chance to to try a variety of tempers. I always thought it'd be a great idea, but we've never seen one yet. We actually have a paddle, which is you know, you basically screw it off and put a different blade on. You know, what's wrong with that? You know, you could literally interchange the blade. Uh, going, it's, all it requires is a screw fit and a bit of fancy to, uh, think, uh, forward thinking. You just basically unscrew one template, stick another one on. You could do the same with a handle, take it off, put another one on. Now, there, then uh, all of a sudden you've got a, that, you know, instead of buying the whole stick, you're just buying part of, part of it. And I think that's got merit. You well, know. I think you better get down to the patent office pretty quick, Steve, because <laughs> you might you might have started uh, some people thinking there. I suppose also, you know, the way that this, uh, our sport is maturing in the UK, um, you know, the eBay uh, and other sites, uh, more people are, as they upgrade, some better quality paddles are coming on the market now. So I wouldn't discourage looking on at places like that. Um, to, to, you know, if you're looking for an upgrade, you, you might find a, find a quite a good deal. So, mm. yeah. 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 And you will find a lot of secondhand paddles, especially the carbon ones, the better ones are quite, they're not cheap. They're still quite expensive, but that begs the point, you know, or makes the point that they are an investment. Uh, a board generally is not an investment. Yeah, they generally just because they get flipped every year or every other year and brands are constantly upgrading with new colorways and they tweak it and this then that and the other sometimes not always for the better mind you but they do uh, whereas paddles tend to be more uh, in situ and, and go the distance but they so when you buy one um you know you'll find second hand you'll find that the, the value is still there uh, when you when you go to sell it for example if you needed to um so what have we got next in store for us okay now, one thing I'd like to say to, to beginners, if you are a beginner, the, the truth of the matter is there's no such thing, wait for it, there's no such thing as a beginner paddle. And by what do we mean by that? Well, certainly not in relation to, you know, a beginner should not have a heavy paddle. It's just, no, you shouldn't have a heavy paddle. No, you should have a paddle that's overly flexible. You should have one that's inefficient in its design and so forth. All those, all those critical matters are, are inescapable that you deserve a good paddle that being said it's quite it's it's more common for you to, for an early an entry level paddle moving into intermediate to have a slightly larger blade area now this might sound a bit counterintuitive but there's a reason for it uh, and you need minimal concave in it too you don't want a big scoop in it because that's just cheating and you think you're paddling really hard and holding water but there is a price to pay at the end of the stroke um, and also you want nice weight and you want perhaps a little bit less blade angle. But again, that's an option we're not, we don't see a lot of, we don't see a lot of differences between blade angles, you know, for example, from zero to five to 10 to 12 to 13 degree blade angles, we're seeing basically everyone gets basically a stock standard 12 thereabouts degrees blade and that's the end of it, which begs the question, well, why? Um, and you, you can benefit by having slightly blade, having less blade angle, and with with newer, with different 
um, paddling techniques coming, uh, sort of evolving lately, uh, lift is something that's almost being, to some extent, negated and taken out of the stroke. So why have so much ang angulation? So there are questions to consider. But you want this larger blade area to come back to this question. The larger blade area is, is important. Why? Because when you when you begin, generally, if you from not from a paddling background, you generally will lack that power, that physiology. You haven't built up that 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 mus musculature that you need to to, to handle. Um, you know the, the small blade, which I'll come to in a moment. So you don't have the precision, the time that you require. So the big blade basically is a compensation for it where you can basically put the paddle in and you can sort of pull relatively slow and you're still gonna get some bite. Now, what happens when you, as you advance and you do get stronger and you, you, your timing does get better and your precision improves, what you're gonna find is that speed and power that you, that you develop and evolve and your technique allows you to slowly go to the smaller, smaller blade because you can still get the same out of the small blade as you were getting out of the bigger blade and actually get, get more, get, get it more efficiently out of the small blade because the small blade will give you less drag, you know, less windage. It's easier to wield and throw around and you can, it's more adaptable to a variety of different, different conditions. Whereas the big paddle can be just a, well, can be a pain in the ass, frankly. Um, but this is what, this is a way to start out and I always advise schools to start, start with, you know, give, give paddles slightly bigger paddles because they le at least they will feel load and they'll feel the take up of, of the catch. Whereas, you know, with the, with the small paddle, they actually won't, you know, because they'll put the paddle and they'll pull, they'll pull so softly that in actual fact, the water, the, the water will fall off the paddle and they won't get the, the sensation that you're actually looking for and you're trying to teach. There are, of course, there are exceptions. If someone comes to you this house and has paddling experience and perhaps give them a smaller paddle, but that's the way to look at it. And, it's, and it can't, I know it all sounds a bit counterintuitive, but that's really where, where you need to be. That's the sort of thinking you should be having. Um, so I'm just coming down to weight and carbon paddles. I'm just aware of the time. Gee, you've been going all right. It's, uh, <laughs> 50 minutes has gone like that. Um, Carbon paddles, yes. Look, um, you know, uh, carbon paddles are, they, they represent the pinnacle of, 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 uh, of, the, of paddle making, but caveat on that, there's some pretty poor ca uh, carbon paddles out there and some of them are quite heavy as well. So, you know, that's something to be concerned. Just because something says it's carbon doesn't mean it's great quality, doesn't mean it's super light. It, there's a lot of things you've got to be careful with with this whole carbon thing and a lot of them are comp carbon composites most are carbon composites to some extent but what is that composite how well is it put together you know you need to look if you're, you're shelving out a lot of money you need to you need some touchy feely you know you need to be able to look at this thing and actually see how it's put together how how good that quality really is because it could be coming out of you know China and not, not, not so good or become it could be coming out of someone's shed in, in the United States and it's absolutely sensational you know so you've got to be a little bit you know discerning about that um, now weight is important but let's not get carried away as well I mean years ago there used to be this fantastic formula going around you take the weight of the play, blade you multiply it by the number of times you swing it and carry it and all this you divide it by your grandmother's age add your telephone number and you got a weight of about 3,000 pounds after paddling so many miles all very interesting, but actually not a lot, of, a lot of rubbish. Because really, when you take the paddle out of the water, if you're paddling correctly, the way that you're paddling in that that exit recovery is you're actually you're actually almost throwing the blade forward, and you it's just a light sort of flick through the wrist and the shoulder and so forth. Now, in, in doing that, the blade actually travels. Of course, it's it's flying through the air almost almost weightless, a bit like if you take a small rock and you chuck it, it's it's weightless. So. So having some, some weight is actually okay, but not a lot. Um, an absolute weightless paddle, which I've certainly used in the past, yeah, they can actually be quite tricky. Uh, yeah, a little bit of weight is okay. The issue is, where is this weight? Now, the swing weight is important of a paddle. And it's true to say that if you have uh, two paddles of, e of equal weight, and one's got more weight in the, in the, in the blade, than the other, it'll feel heavier to use than the, the one that's got a better distribution of weight throughout the, the, the paddle in total. It's got a nice light blade. So, you know, there are, again, there are caveats there too, but the, the swing weight's not an important. It's a bit like when you play golf, you know, they, I know 
don't know the first thing about golf, but you know, I think with golf, what one what when I've read about it to sort of make comparisons, the swing weight is important because it does a lot of the work for you and it can assist can assist you to a point. And this is the same is true of, of, of paddling. So swing weight becomes now, how do you try that swing weight? Well again, yeah, you can go in a store and just try it. You stand up on a stool and just try it. If you're just in a retail store, you can go in there and just just get that idea of swinging it. And one thing I teach people is to swing through and let, let the low hand go. So you let the, let, the, let the blade fly forward and see how it returns to you. Get a feel for it in your hand. How, how, how can you micromanage that paddle? Is it, does it feel like you're in control of it or you just out? You just can never get control of it. And then add in wind and water and all the rest of it. You can get a fair idea that it's going to be either um, a nightmare or something's going to will work for you. So, the greatest issue about weight, of course, is you pay for it. You pay a lot of money for weight. But like I say, you know, not just because something's carbon, you need, and you'll be, you'll be really, really surprised. Go to websites for paddles and you'll see how very few of them actually give you an actual weight. How, how, how many will actually commit to saying, well, it, may, it weighs 13 ounces or 15 or 27 or one kilogram, whatever it might be. They're very risk averse to that. They just they go, it's carbon, it's fantastic, it's got this great shape and it's got dimples and it's got the concaves in the right spot. And then you buy it on that basis. And you know, Fred Van Akapan told you you should, so you buy it. And then you get it and you go, hmm, not so good after all. So again, be be careful or ask questions about the weight and, and learn what the difference between, say, a super, super lightweight paddle is all the way through to a very heavy one and somewhere in between. And then you get an idea what you're you know, what you're up against. Um, Steve, just uh, out, out of interest, what mm. actually is the weight of the, one of the light, some of the lighter paddles that are on the market? Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's a good extreme example of, of outrigger canoe paddles. I mean, if you, if you think that you can make a, an outrigger paddle in the, in the vicinity of, um, you know, like 15 ounces or something crazy, which is a super, super light paddle, um, and then they go up, to, you're going up to sort of 20, 22 ounces, you know, when you, and they're, they're sort of absolutely, and, it's, and you've only got to add the shaft, make the shaft a bit longer and you can certainly be within those realms, but you, you but, um, the, the thing about the stand up paddle, of course, is the shaft and, and the comp and then the amount of, uh, leverage it's put on it. So you've actually got to, you do have to build up some weight into it. Um, but you know, these days, anything under a pound, you know, is, is pretty good. Uh, and then if you start getting into, like I say, get into the spooky, spooky realms of, of racing paddles, they're going to be considerably less. Um, but again, weight is an issue which, as I say, you've got to be very careful about because it can be that they're so light that they're they're fragile, and they could be they have dry layups. I mean, one of the ways to cheat the system with carbon paddles is to just, you know dry them out to the point there's very, very little way of epoxy in there or the, the, the resin they put in so then they and they they get they might get up and baked they might get to vacuum bagged vacuum bags where you basically like a wrapping on it and you it gets suction on it and it squeezes out all the excess but it's all well and good but it can make for a very dry layup and that creates fracture points and and uh, dry spots which is not clever but a lot of the weight is one of the things you'll find with, pad with carbon paddles is that they try to make, because they're expensive, they try to make them look glossy and, ex and fancy. And actually that puts a lot of weight into the, into the paddle almost unnecessarily. Whereas actually, you know, like some of the better super expensive carbon ones look a bit industrial because they don't, they don't worry about all that gloss effect. They don't worry about that lacquering and they just pretty much just churn it out and give it to you just wet and dried. Here it is, you know, so, um, yeah, much like a matte finish then, I guess. Um, Mark, yeah. Mark saying the, the, the Werner Grand Prix is 415 grams. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, some of the weights you see are, are astonishing. And, um, you know, I guess the thing is, um, you know, we'll, we'll, I, I've, and I've seen paddles snap for sure, and they, and they do. And it's, one thing to remember, when, it, when a carbon paddle snaps, it's pretty catastrophic. And I've seen guys uh, have stitches, you know, uh, that's not, that can happen. So they, you know, they, they snap and then you get stuck, stuck, in, stuck into you or you can, they snap and they go into the hands. So you, light's good, but just be really, yeah. Again, this comes down to, you know, get your paddle and you've got to be inspected, you know, go through it. You know, every time, you've got to have, every time you go back on the water, just give it a bit of a look over, just see if there's any stress fractures, anything going on with it. Because, any funny noises like and what you'll find with carbon is though it won't give you any notice 
it will basically just snap. It goes snap. That's, there's no creaking, no funny weirdness and noise. It does snap. No carb, uh, fiberglass will make a bit of a noise. Um, timber certainly makes a bit of a noise. Sometimes it can go just suddenly, but it's rare. Um, but carbon will just suddenly go and you can see, but that's why you need to maintain it and also just have a good look at it, you know. Um, a question, Steve, coming in. Um, are, if that should happen to our paddles, um, are they repairable, the carbon paddles? Uh, it depends on how catastrophic they are. Well, actually, to be fair, you can snap one in half and you can repair them, but they, they, the trouble with any repair you ever do on carbon or anything similar is that where the repair ends, uh, it's always, the, the, the repair is going to be stronger than the actual, the original paddle, generally speaking, so it's going to then create a weak point uh, where the repair ends. So the repair needs to be quite, if you've got a, wherever the crack is, you need to almost like run another layer of carbon very, very long to the top towards the bottom, to sort of spread that load out, you know, if you if you with me, uh, rather than concentrating it back in, in where the original uh, injury or the original break was. Um, also, it's going it will affect the flex properties. And once you start messing around with putting in repairs, uh, the flex um, that was inherently built into it will be compromised to some extent. So yeah, and then it's it's the dreaded chip on the blade as well, isn't it itself, which um, pretty difficult well, to. To repair, but I'm, I know it can be done because I've had some repaired myself. Well, on, 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 on super really high quality uh, ones, for example, you know, the, the carbon is, is sandwiched at the end here. There's no foam there whatsoever. You can just see, can you see that lip? You can see there's like a, a lip between yeah. the lip. Yeah. Yeah, that's, there's nothing there, but that's where the foam begins. And, then, and this one actually uses a very spooky material um the foam and uh, i believe it's used in bathoscopes which is pretty that's pretty extreme now this here you can actually sand that back so if you have any chips you just get the sandpaper and you can sand it and it's not uncommon for some paddles to get these and sand quite a bit of they sand all the way around to make it even smaller but there's there for stone chips and for whacking them too when you're doing river running that sort of thing so you know that's a that's a that's a great sort of paddle to have because you can constantly you know, to tend to it with with uh, with a bit of sandpaper. Now, a lot, most again, most a huge number of paddles come that they have maybe like a PVC uh, reinforcing around the edges where they join. The problem with that is that it's a plastic and it doesn't uh, it creates adhesion problems and delamination problems. Once that starts to get cracked and bashed and whacked, you know, you, a bit of sandpaper won't cut it. You've actually got to get in there and start doing some serious, um, you know, carbon fiber work to to repair it. Um, and of course, delaminations comes when water gets in there. Water gets in, it expands in the heat, and it pulls the, uh, the, the, the actual material away from the, the, the foam, for example, and you've got real issues. Yeah, all kinds of things to think about there, isn't it? How, how the paddle is affected once we undergo the repair. Um, yeah. What Michelle, Michelle's asking, and I'm not quite sure if this is the right time to ask this question to you now, Steve, but um, Michelle's saying, and, and if it's not, please move on and we can address it later. But should, should folks be looking at uh, buying a fixed or an adjustable paddle? What's your, what's your advice there? Um, well, it's, it's a relatively simple answer, really. I mean, f fixed is it, if you're not sharing your paddle between buddies and mates and friends and uh, you feel that you've got one particular paddle, uh, one board that you use but predominantly, then you'd buy for that for that you know to some now the, the idea behind this fix is basically that you can get away with a much lighter a lighter paddle because you don't have the all the uh, moving extension parts on it so that that is an is an advantage and of course they tend to be more durable overall because as soon as you start putting drilling holes in and putting clips and extensions so that's just another piece to go wrong and to to create a weak spot it also affects the actual flex properties of the paddle in as a whole you know to have a continuity of flex from tip to grip is is affected by making it into a into an adjustable um the the the, the issue comes and i i can see where she might be coming with michelle michael might be coming with this but if you for example have some people have a number of, of race balls now you can have there are some there are a couple of super lightweight adjustable paddles but they're still they're some of them are superb they're not they're still not 100% but they're, they're close you know to what would what would be what would be acceptable but if you've got a number of boards you want to use you might want to use a different 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 lengths and that becomes where you start to really question if you and now and they're not cheap but man they're, they're they're wicked money they're not they are a good investment nice guess if you're going if that's where you want to go but the real 
most all serious races are just using a fixed that's it and they'll have if they've got to buy two or three or four because it's some of them they're sponsored you know they can afford to do that but if you could if you had that luxury that's what you do and if you had the luxury of it now remember that a two piece is still not a travel paddle it's, you've got to get to three pieces to really be in the travel into the travel realms where you're going to stick it in the hold uh, or in a travel bag effectively otherwise it's going to go generally oversized luggage and blah 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 so yeah just keep an eye on that you know say the flex properties can be affected the weight can be affected uh and it's a get it's a micromanagement issue and it's a finance issue you know just just what you the affordability yeah and you you were talking about the one piece um there steve um the one the one cut we all have that one cut and i'm sure some of the audience here have uh, made the wrong cut yep. you can always um well we, well, we cannot, if we cut too short, we can't add it back on, can we? Any advice when it comes to, you know, paddle length and um, people cutting their paddles and setting, setting the handle? Yeah. Uh, that one, because it's a, it can be a very costly mistake. Yeah, I mean, I've got something, uh, that so people sent me here. Let's have to go, I'll just move on a bit to, say paddle length you know what what length from tip to grip you know which is actually quite essential because you know and before i even go there you know to establish that you really need to go through this process here so i've got my arms uh raised by my head i'm going for a 90 degree sort of angle um what you do is you form that shape and then i tend to just move the lower hand one hand span in from that and it, and it tends to be just about right for for most people now if you don't but if you don't get that right at the beginning then actually the whole process of then trying to establish what length blade or paddle you need from tip to grip becomes an issue and again this is a dark art and just to sort of reinforce that i think i've got a picture here somewhere right okay so you know there's the shaka, there's the six inch, there's the eight inch, there's the stand like this, there's the put the shot, there's a million ways to do it, right? Stand on a chair and recite the national anthem. I mean, yeah, it's just like, most of it's complete nonsense. Um, th there is only one way to establish how do you, how, what paddle length you need. So here's again, here's a photograph of myself. So we can we use this now area canoeing, but we're sat down obviously. But the most plausible selection it's used in canoeing, all sorts of forms of canoeing, and it applies to stand up. The most plausible selection of an appropriate paddle is as follows: when paddling on, say, flat water, exercising good technique. Now, do you have good technique? Okay, and form 60 to 70 percent effort, so you're not going flat out, and when the blade is fully submersed. In other words, you're at that sort of hand over hand position, we're in that power phase, shaft vertical. Okay your top hand needs to be about level with your forehead more or less at that point okay now that's important because that is when you're stressing your body the most it's that that's the most stressful uh, point now the good thing about this at this point is you, your elbow is at least at the same level as your shoulder or lower than that's important and having and it's pointing downwards they're really important things um and once you start to get a handle on what that is, so when you go out and start paddling with, this, with the paddle you've got, let's say you've cut it and you just put some duct tape around it, you haven't glued it yet, but you've done the first cut, and you think that's about right. Just go out there and just, just paddle and just get a feel for it and try to monitor where that, monitor where that top hand is. Is it here? Am I stirring porridge here, here or, am I, or am, I, am I up here or am I down there? The people talk about shoulder injuries. And of course, it's not, it's, critical it's very important and you know one of the things about shoulder injuries is this is the rotator cuff okay you have the glenoid cavity and then you've got the human you know, humerus sits up inside of it and it rolls around like this now as you raise your raise your arm okay it basically the humerus gets it closes the space in the glenoid cavity and when it closes that space there's a little sheath and that sheath is a protective sheath for the nerve endings, but you can rub those through and eventually that's when you get shoulder injury. So if you're, if you're working up here and you're compressing down like that and you're at, the, you're at that hand over hand phase when you're very high and the elbow is above the level of the shoulder, you are absolutely in danger territory there. That's where you're already, you know, you're already in, in going to be setting yourself up for injury. So Again, it's critical to take note of that. Okay, it really is critical to take 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 that on board. All right. Um, 
so now some people are born by the way with very narrow spaces between that uh, glenoid cavity and the humerus and other people have have, have um, you know, a bigger distance so again it might some people have a genetic issue with that as well it just just happens to be they're going to be more susceptible so that sort of helps hopefully and as i say you know it's, it's a question of just establish where the lower hand is you've got other issues too haven't we you know, these issues of look at the board thicknesses here you've got a thick board and a narrow and a, and a slim board but again this is where it comes back to the either the adjustable a good quality one or if you can then you you're going to mix it up mix up your paddles now one if in this in this instance one's for surf this board and the other one's for racing so you've and should you use the same paddle for both the answer to that is probably no because one is more specialist it's a niche you know one's one thing and one's another thing but they are not just you, you have you have boards that are six seven inches thick as against four and three quarters or thereabouts so there's going to be variants of three of you know two to three inches that's not insignificant that will absolutely impact the the length of paddle that you that you end up using okay so does that help you there one chris yeah that's a great bit of advice there steve thank you very much yes yeah but again get get familiar with all those things um I was just going to talk about performance. You know, I mean, you know, the paddle. I mean, the paddle is all about. It's all about you know cementing yourself into the ground, into the water in this case, and then pulling yourself up to it. And then we we talk about technique and how to paddle and how to establish that catch and through the pull phase. I mean, that's another another topic altogether. But of course, if the tool you're using isn't isn't up to the job, then you know that's going to be a problem. And of course, we need we just, we just discussed the uh, blade area and and so forth, and that's not irrelevant because you know you want to be working towards the smallest blade area you can possibly manage, so you've got that grip. Remembering all the time that when something is stationary in the water and you're pulling yourself up to the blade, okay, that's all it needs to do. There's no variance of stationary. Stationary is stationary is stationary. If it's not moving, it's not moving. It's doing its job. So it doesn't matter whether the paddle's big or small. As long as it's not moving, it's doing its job. So you need to just find out what the smallest blade you can use is, uh, as, as feasible. As I say, paddlers will move from bigger to smaller over time because the smaller ones will give them all that they need and they can just as fast as a guy with, you know, and faster than the guy with the big, the big blade. Because the guy with the big blade is going to get fatigued a lot faster. So if you can use, use a small paddle, that's great. But you, some people are limited, as I say, they're limited to the big paddle because of their body mass. And that's just a fact of, of life, unfortunately. Okay. So flat blade, flat blade tips and curved blade tips. Some blades have a slight curve, some will be dead straight. There's a slight variance there. The curves were originally put in because you, if you're entering straight down, you've got that slight curved entry which is which is which is uh, it takes the little plopping away at the beginning it prevents water being taken down whereas a straight a straight one would wouldn't work against you that's why with the straighter paddles you've got to sort of come around a little bit from the side rather than going straight down so that again that's a variance of design you need to look for um, in in uh, in the paddles that you're that you're seeking out and again that relates to your paddling style um, Slippage, something I was going to cover. Um, so slippage basically occurs when, when a few things happen. It can happen as a result of poor catch, which is a technical thing. It can happen because your body mass exceeds the blade area. In other words, you're just a very heavy person. And as you're pulling, it's just not coping with that at all. Your strength could be so that it exceeds the blade area. It could be a factor of both mass and strength added together. The drag exceeds the blade area. And for example, if you are going upwind, and you've got a very small blade you can find that slipping so that's working against you could just be poor blade design you know um so again multiple factors there to to uh to consider it comes down to what i said before though your blade area only needs to be as large as required to become anchored so as long as the blade is stationary a bigger size will make no difference at all is doing is actually adding more fatigue and more drag to your to your experience okay so that's really slippage in a nutshell but you you know i i um with the technical side of things we've been discussing over the, over the few weeks uh, understanding how to prevent slippage is really important because it does you could have the best paddle in the world and still get slippage and that's that's going to be ultimately going to start someone's going to start looking at your technique and say well actually we need to look at your technique as to why this slippage is occurring and then we need to start micromanaging that to improve it. and it could be blade size it could just be that you're not up to the task of 
of, of pulling correctly at this point, or perhaps you're just not strong enough for the blade or, or whatever. But there's always those micromanagement details that, that, that are essential to consider. Um, here's another one. Total blade area must be considered in relation to where that area is. Much like board volume must be considered in the same way. So it's more misleading information. You know, it's no, it's no good saying your board's got 250 liters or 350 liters. Where is the volume? It could all be in the nose and none in the tail. And all of a sudden you've got a different discussion on your hands. It's the same with the paddle. Blade area, which has become a, another catch cry for selling. It's got so many square inches. Well, big deal. Where is it? Where is that blade area? You know, is it all down the bottom, all up the top? Is it nice and long and skinny? Is it short and fat and wide? I mean, that's the real issue. The blade area is, <laughs> as I say, it's a very misleading thing, and you need to, to forearm yourself with this information and question and go, yeah, yeah, blade area, but where is the blade area? You know, board, board volume, but where is the board? Where is the volume in the board? You know, if, if you not start, you have to think for yourself and protect yourself. I've got illustrations here, you know, these paddles here in the corner. You know, four different paddles, and every one of them is, offers completely different things. So you've got, if you look at everything outside of the paddle, paddle so if you were to take these black lines going up to the shoulder, it's not what you see or what the blade gives you. It's actually what's missing that's almost important because, you know, here you've got all this white space. This is all missing. There's nothing there missing, missing, you know, all these areas are missing. You know, but what's interesting about these paddles is that, you know, how the power band, you know, this power band between these white lines, this, this is the power of so where these power bands lie. And, it's, and, and, and it all gives different, different feelings of the way the paddle works. If, if, it's gonna, if all the energy is down the bottom at the tip, it makes sense that it's, it's very likely to want to trip over itself because it's held down the bottom. There's nothing at the top stopping it from falling over, which is why the, what we find with stand up, you know, because you're standing, it pays to have the higher aspect paddle. Generally speaking, especially if you're taller, because you've got that long, tall, uh, progressive uh, area and it doesn't trip over itself because there's, there's more mass or more volume rather, or blade area going higher and higher up here rather than all being concentrated nice and low down, which if you're sitting is absolutely fine because it's a different, it's a different mechanism. When you start to stand, all bets are off. It's a very different experience. Um, so that's something to again, consider. Now, that being said, there's a caveat, of course, if you're in the surf and you're spending a lot of time, you know, down low or perhaps doing downwind and you're sort of crouching down low and sort of really powering up, Right. then the teardrop sort of shape, the lower aspect becomes more, more relevant. So I'm not going to use a, I'm not going to say to you that's for all aspects of standard part of warning because there are all different facets of it. So therefore you need to be aware of, you know, what am I doing? Is this fit for purpose? What am I more likely to do? If you're cruising, just and not really getting over the top of the stroke at all, just sort of cruising along, you know, the higher aspect paddle is absolutely the way to go. But as you get more and more aggressive and you get lower and lower and lower, and you're sort of doing more uh, you know, acrobatics on the board, you know, running back and forth and carrying on, trying to melt with the ocean over and moving around, then the lower aspect pedal can actually be a help. Um, but again, there are caveats to that too. If you're racing and you're on really choppy water, but it's not big, but it's, it's quite choppy, then the high aspect pedal is very good too, because again, it's progressive. You can always, you know, you can use a little bit or a lot of it. The top of the small short pal is you've got to kind of use all of it or it doesn't really work very well so different again horses for courses in terms of how you use the blade um rounded shafts okay so you've got a rounded shaft or you've got an oval shaft and again you know um the oval shaft is a superior animal, but you don't see it that much. Why? Because it's a pain in the ass to make. So we get, we're basically constricted primarily to, to experiencing rounded shafts because they're easy just to put on a, on a, on a loom and make them, you know, whereas the, the, the oval is, is, uh, is not, but it, from an engineering point of view, it's stronger. Um, the beauty is with the oval shaft is actually, you can just rest the oval in, in the, you know, in the, in the, you know, just in your fingers and you can just pull really easily and there's no, it's not spinning off axis. And with a round shaft, of course it spins. It's, it's, a, it's you know, circular and it's gonna move inside of your, in, in your hand space. So I think this is a, I don't know if you can see that one, that's actually a, 
see it's got straight that's got a side wall it's a side wall that's that's an oval okay all right so that's nice and i can you can literally paddle with this just by putting your putting in there and you're pulling against a, a nice ridge whereas if with the rounded paddle you don't have that luxury you've actually got to squeeze it quite not hard but you've got to give it a little bit of a, a nudge to keep maintain control of it so it's, it's a little harder to use but as i say very few paddles out there with um that are oval um, and again it all comes down to cost and just being a pain in the neck to people actually make them um, grip circumference something i mentioned briefly at the beginning but grip circumference is, is important you know if if, if, a, if the shaft is too small you'll find yourself having to overly grip it to maintain control by the same token if it's too big you're going to lose control of it so you, again this is important and that's a question you should be looking at. You know, what is it, what's the optimum shaft um, grip circumference that, that, that works for me? You know, at least find the, the sort of the limits, the upper limits and tolerances that are appropriate to you and your hands, because some people have very long fingers, some are short, wide, wide hands and so forth. We're all different. Um, and just a note on that, I mentioned before in my previous webinars, you know, you're not trying to, a lot of, a lot of people complain about forearm aching and, uh, you know, getting, getting problems there. You're not, you're not trying to squeeze the living daylights out of the shaft. If you are, you're doing it, you're doing things all wrong. Either your technique is incorrect or the paddle is, is just, you know, very hard to manage and you'd have, you're having to do that, but you really be wanting to be, you're really pulling off, off these two fingers. Okay. You're pulling off these two fingers largely. Little fingers almost relaxed and not doing a great lot, great deal. And in the recovery, it's basically transferring to this area here as a rollock. As you're coming through, it's going to roll through and come back. But you're actually pulling through here, and as you roll through, it's rolling in here. Okay. And again, a lot of people have been paddling for years. I've got a big lump here. You know, a lot of paddlers have got those big calluses because that's the rollicking action where, where the shaft's rolling, but you're really just pulling off of off these lower fingers. And you should be able to just literally pull with those lower fingers and not squeeze at all. No, no squeezing going on at all. So again, and you're finding a balance between that load at the top and pull from the bottom. And that's what's giving that nice balance. And then you're you're at one with the with this with this instrument. Okay, so um, again. So, so Steve, um, Ben's just asking a question here. Would, would an oval shaft help reduce flutter or slippage? Um, yeah, I mean, possibly it could because I mean, obviously, um, your pull could be more directional. You know, it's more, it's it's a more positive um, uh, mechanism for pulling against. If that makes sense. So yes, when a paddle flutters, it oscillates, and as it's oscillating, of course, that that comes up through through the through the shaft, and of course, it it could be that even when you're pulling, that your thing, you're actually you know you're not you haven't got full control of that shaft so potentially um why not it, it could well be and i think that you know anything we can do to, to mitigate um flutter and maximize control has to be a good thing so i would say yes in potentially um the oval shaft could could assist as one part of multiple factors which goes towards eliminating that um that that uh, that flutter the other thing about the um you know, with the round shaft, so you tend to, because you're gripping a little harder sometimes, you do feel that you are, it's weird, the, hard, the harder you grip, the less control you have. It's weird because you, lo you lose touch, you lose feel. You know, it's because it's, when you've got, when you aren't just on the lower fingers, it feels light and you, you can feel every movement down there coming from the blade. And, and if you have the oval, the beauty about the oval is exactly that. And when you're pulling through, you really can feel any deviation and you can compensate if you need to. But when you're gripping the living daylights of a rounded shaft, it's again, it does negate some of the way that it's talking back to you in terms of what you're feeling, you know, so that's not insignificant. I find um, the oval shaft very useful in the surf, you know, you've got a wipeout, you've got to grab your paddle really quickly uh, and you just, you know, instantly you get that feel, yep, right, it's the right way around, bang, off I go. Now that's a good point. That's one good thing you just said the right way around. Now that's one very good point. You you know, with, with the oval shaft, you kind of know where you are. You know, it can only be well one way or the other. Whereas the around it could be anywhere. Do you know what I mean? So because the oval shaft maintains maintains position, and when you grab it, you kind of know. Oh great, it feels yeah, it feels correct. I've got it. I've got control of it. When you when you have the rounded shaft, is you don't you don't really know, and you 
it can slide, it can, it can twist off axis with every stroke you take, you know, and that's not what you want. You don't want any, any, any movement like this, which is what the chat was just asked before. Um, because you know, you could be that it is literally rotating in your, in your finger, between your fingers, you know, like between in your palm. Yeah, and if you're in the impact zone, you need to get out there as quickly as possible, as if, as efficiently as possible for those of us who suck surf. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, having your paddle the right way around is a pretty useful tip. Yeah, yeah, that helps. So yeah, again, another micromanagement, another thing you can look for in paddles, in in good ones, and uh, so they're pretty rare, but uh, absolutely worth it. it. It's again, it's a game changer. I mean, Chris, you probably paddle with both styles and, you know, once you start paddling with an oval shot, it's very hard to go back to a rounder one. You know, that's what I've, I've found, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the levels of control are very, very different. Uh, concaves, quickly on this one, uh, fuzzy logic. You know, the idea of putting concaves into paddles is fuzzy logic. Why? Because it cheats the system. It gives it this impression that when you, well, on entry, that you, you've, you've got a small bucket there. It's this little little uh, uh, dimpled area is that you can you know grab a whole a bunch of water oh great i i feel good because i've got a bunch of water okay the trouble is that you then got to get rid of it and at the end of the stroke it's still there and that's where the heavily concave paddles become a real problem because they are fatiguing you have to have very early exit if you don't and like when you're in school situations what you'll often see is paddlers running backwards and falling off back because that's because the paddles overly loaded at the end of the stroke and many beginners will pull too far back and with a with a heavily concave paddle it's just an accident waiting to happen to pull you pull you backward um, but they are it, it, it's it is fuzzy logic uh, because the best way to get good catch is through good placement loading up the paddle with speed uh, with an efficient blade that has, that has not has no concaves at all absolutely none there's no need for it it really is just a it's a panacea it's a thing that's put there to to compensate a compensatory thing for people who just kind of need that little bit of load but you will find they are very fatiguing now, there are some special paddles that have been designed in the past which they have a slight concave in them but when you pull the bizarre thing is when you set the paddle the concave's there, and when you pull, it disappears. So it literally goes from being a concave to flat, kind of cool, really, because it kind of gives you at least that, you know, that load that you might feel that you need. But again, it's still quasi, it's a quasi reality because it's just, it's the feel that you're feeling with the, with the concave is just, it's uh, not necessarily translating into what you were trying to achieve. You know, it's not because what you want to do is basically pull against water that's not moving. You're going to achieve that through through sound technique. You can't build that into a paddle and expect it to to suddenly give you uh, that that uh, that uh, thing that you're looking for. So again, it's fuzzy logic. So don't get sucked into oh, just get my paddle feels really good. You, know, you try oh yeah, you know, I can feel that it feels really powerful. Quote unquote, no paddle is powerful. That's nonsense. No, there's no such thing as a powerful paddle. There's only an efficient one. Uh, you're the person that gives power to it, and uh, if you don't give the right power to it, you got nothing. So that's really what it amounts to. <laughs> okay. In fact, the more load you feel at the beginning of the paddle, it shouldn't feel so loaded up, it's practically pulling you off the board. Because if it does, then that's massively fatiguing. You don't need that. You, the best paddles in the world are the ones that literally you can determine. They're like an accelerator pedal. You can literally put as much or as little power as you want to or speed you want to, and they work at all different speeds and levels of, of the thrust that you're applying to it. Some paddles, literally um you have to sort of thrash the living daylights out to get anything out of them and that's not good either or even these ones that say they're giving this fuzz or they feel like they're doing a great deal and actually not doing a lot at all they're just making you tired and this comes back to paddling technique people that feel like oh, you know if you if you're the sort of person that feels like you're not in pain and you're when you're paddling you're gonna be pulling like hell because you feel that's that's that is a sign, a signal, a trigger that's telling you, my God, I'm working hard. I must be going fast. Well, you need to reevaluate that very quickly because that's not what paddling is. It's meant to be fluid. Um, it's meant to be relaxed and to have a series of relaxation, tension, relaxation, tension, but it's not meant to be that. Okay. Um, sprinting is different. Sprinting is all about pain. There's just no way around it. If I were to me is paddling, it's stolen. That's a different game altogether. Anyway, that's, that's another topic. Um, Flutter, we sort of covered that. 
the idea of the blade, you know, obviously fluttering as it's coming through the water. That's basically water particles leaving either side. And to be fair, a lot of, you know, a lot of, a lot of flutter occurs toward the end of the stroke um, or the midway through it primarily because there's a softening. You're, as you're coming off the power, then that's when the water particles will start to leave. And this, this exit phase is really important. So you don't want flutter, but you want to be able to lift the paddle out of the water cleanly. You don't want a big, a big uh, mass there holding you down. So that's really important. So very clean blade faces, you know, will exit very clean, very clean light. It, it should enter like a knife into butter and exit in the same way. Yeah, you know, it doesn't want to go down like a, you know, like a big bucket or you know, sort of like a plop and then come out with a plop. It needs to slice in, slice out. It has a very has a zingy feel about it. That's very, very super encouraging. And which brings me, I think, to uh, flex. Flex is an interesting point. So flex is um, many finished guys, but you know flex is something that uh, it occurs in the blade, where it morphs under load. It, it happens at the neck where the where the blade joins to the shaft, and it happens throughout the length of the shaft itself. So you've got three prime areas it could possibly ha happens. The two prime areas are would be, you know the the uh, the the the, the, blade, the blade itself in the in the shaft. So you know. Again, you've got to look. You've got to sort of balance this up. Now, obviously, this is the worst case scenario. This is using a, a plastic, basically polycarbonate type fin. That's going to end up paddle. That's going to lead to a lot of a lot of problems. But how much flex is enough, and how much is you know too little? You know, this is really not. Um, this is really important. If um, you can see this chap here, you can see how much flex is in that in that paddle there. I mean, that's just appalling. That's just too much because really, because it's acting like a shock absorber. You're sticking in, he's pulling, and of course, all the energy he's putting in is really just, most of what he's doing is energy is being spent in bending the paddle and not much of it's translating into forward drive at all. Okay, so you've got to find a halfway house. Now, that being said, if you've got pre-existing injuries and so forth, then there's the softer, the softer shaft, a bit of flex and bend in it is, is a very good thing for you. It will protect your joints. That's important. And again, when you're starting out, you don't want to, you don't, you do not want to have a really stiff, uh, stiff uh, shaft. You want to, you want to make sure you get something that's, that has got some flex, but not as much as that. And it'll, it'll occur to you when you pally, you should be looking for it. You should be looking for that. Well, is it, is it flexing too much? Again, that's a feel orientated thing. Um, and you'll get the, you'll feel that it's too flexible if it feels squidgy and it, and you think, and if you try to, if you've got the ability to power up a little harder, just pull a little harder and it just feels heavy and squidgy, even though it's quite a light paddle, then it's kind of telling you already this is too flexible. And as paddlers get stronger and fitter and the guys are racing, they're all, they all tend to go to a, a stiffer uh, construction. Why? Because for every pound of energy they put in, they want to, they want to get the pound out, but for every bit that's, being lost in flex, that's, that's, that's a waste uh, in terms of energy expenditure. The other good thing about having a paddle that has some flex at all is that on the exit, it ha comes out with what we call, uh, with, a, with, a, with a recoil. Okay, so as it morphs back into shape, it comes out with a sort of boing, there's a sort of spring to it, which is very encouraging in terms of allowing you to trans, uh, to, to move, if you like, from that exit to the recovery in that swing through. If you have a shaft that's very, very stiff when it comes out, it comes out dead, you literally are having to carry it all the way through to the entry again through that recovery, but then it's giving you no encouraging sort of feel, feeling at all. So, you know, be, be aware of that too. It is just about right spring, but not too much. So it's just basically not, it's being ineffectual. Um, so again, lighter paddlers you know as against heavier paddlers you know there there's a difference there when a heavier paddler is going to bend a uh, bend a shaft uh, considerably more than the lighter paddler just through sheer mass and the drag that's being created through the board itself and the weight acting downwards so again you know depending on your weight uh, you're going to you're going to you're going to look at the, the different flex properties i mean a heavier paddler generally will need to have a slightly stiffer shaft just by just by nature of the of, of themselves because if they have too much flex it will be all flex and not much pull um so the lighter paddlers can get away with a bit more flex they kind of need it because of that too so again it's a balancing act and um and again not all not all companies offer that but some do and um 
those that do should be commended. It's, it's a great, it's a great thing to, 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 to find out. How, how do they do this? Well, they add, they tend to add fiberglass to the, they call it composite, but they're, they're putting, generally putting GRP in there to give it some, some flex. So, and they, they should tell you a percentage. They'll tell you it's, a, it's you know, it's a, it's a 60, 40 or a 70, 30. So they give you the breakdown of what's, you know, the percentages and, and what's, uh, what's there. Some shafts, by the way, are tapered. And that's a great thing too. A tapered shaft is pretty cool. Um, so a tapered shaft with a noble shape would be even better. So um, where are we now? So we've covered um, paddle length. I'm getting towards the end now, guys, but I mean, for those who join us a bit late, but anyway, this is, I think you're recording this, aren't you, Chris? Uh, yes, we are, yeah. It'll be yeah. available on uh, the WSA YouTube um, okay. channel, which you can see on our WSA Facebook. You can look, sit, view it yep. that way. Yep. Um, so yes, yeah, I mean, just coming down to the practical aspects of paddles in general, you know, it, it, you know, the idea of having the, we were all asked this question, you know, whether to go for a fixed or go for a adjustable two piece or break apart paddles, you know, there's, there's all the options, but it does come down to, to cost. And, um, you know, if you, if the one piece is still going to be the, uh, the elite level, the, the, the most, the, the best in terms of performance, you go to a two piece. It's absolutely fine, but again, if you want to get a super good carbon one that's two piece, it's not cheap. The problem with the two piece ones, if you buy just the regular cheap ones, there are multiple issues with those um, that you have to be aware of. You know, because it's adjustable, it's a sliding telescopic setup. Um, sand is its enemy, salt water is its enemy. Um, some you'll see low grade stainless steel uh, bits of equipment used where that becomes a problem. Uh, with screw fitments and so forth, or the clips, internal clips and so forth. Um, they can be a problem. Sometimes they'll fill up with water because there's no, there's no closed foam inside of them. So there are multiple things to look for. And even, even the system of clips that they use, you've either got, you know, just a fold over latch, which could have a single bolt or a double bolt, go for the double bolt if you can. Um, there are ones that screw up, they are okay, but again, they're susceptible to sand, to sand getting in there and that, that can be a, an issue. They can, if you leave them over time, you can't get them undone. Um, so yeah, adjustables, very practical, great thing to have for you. If perhaps you've got a number of bores that you need, that you might go between. Um, but generally they use largely for schools and they used for families where they want to share between everybody. You know, so that's really the, the thrust of their existence. Um, the three-piece paddles for traveling, of course, they break down. You can put them in the hole a lot, a lot better than you can run going oversized luggage. And again, to have, find one of those in the carbon version is uh, at the higher end of being light. Uh, it's tricky. And again, the bend flex qualities of those will be not as neat and groovy and smooth and fluid as, say, buying the, the fixed one. But, you know, if you want to travel in style, then perhaps that, that can only be the, the only way to go. But got a symbol there of dollars, and you know it's, it all comes down to the dosh. You know, how much money do you want to invest in, in your paddle? But at the end of the day, you know it, it really is important to 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 pay attention to the paddle. It is absolutely the most significant thing that you will purchase in terms of your experience of your stand-up paddleboarding experience. Um, twice the money spent on a, on a on a paddle will give you twice the paddle often, whereas twice the money on the board won't give you twice the board. And that's really the reality of it. Um, so money spent on a good paddle will tend to give you better and better um, performance and it will keep you on the water longer. You'll enjoy your paddling more. Uh, all the technical things, all, all, the, all the classes and lessons in the world that, you're, that you, you can listen to will make no difference if you've got a, a water whacker from hell. You've really got to have, invest well and, um, and uh, take your paddling to another level. So yeah. I think I've covered, I mean, I've tried to cover as much as I can. There's just so much. I mean, it's a massive topic. We've already gone way over time as usual, but um, it is just, there's just so much to talk about. But I'm happy to take any questions. Well, I'm, I'm just mindful of time, Steve, and you've given us a, a fascinating, fascinating insight into, it, like you said, say, a massive topic. Um, you know, a lot of the slides that people are viewing here are fr taken from your book. So for those people that, you know, may want to take this to another level. Um, if you just tell us about your book, Steve, just briefly and how, how people can purchase it, because um, mm. it's, it's full of m so many useful tips and the paddle section is um, 
extremely well covered as is as is everything really so how, how can people buy your book steve and what's, what's it called well yes the book's actually got something like 50 56 or 60 pages about paddles in there which is quite bizarre really but <laughs> it is there is practically a book in itself but uh canoeculture.com k-a-n-u.com canoe culture and that's the book there it's kind of people refer to it as the bible um you know it's five years to create that there's an awful lot of information in it um and every topic there's so many topics in there covered very thoroughly and um you know it's uh you know it, it, again it's a good investment i i believe and remember i always tell people this isn't just about me telling you what i think the not, not gospel according to me you know you gotta remember this is me uh, having interviewed a lot of people spoken to a lot of people and participating in paddle sports for near on 40 years now so what's in there is a summation of so much uh, of knowledge that's been given and passed on to me like a tribal elder i suppose i'm more than happy to share what i know and i'm i'm I must i make an apology for anything that sounds counterintuitive sometimes uh, or sometimes i i might it sounds contradictory um it's certainly not meant to and um you know it's it's, it's one of those things that there are the fact of the matter is we're all so different you know every one of us is an individual and um, because of that, you know, we perceive things differently and we want to be sort of catered for individually. And, um, you know, so I, I don't mean to confuse anyone, but I'm always happy to answer questions that, uh, through our website, through the information uh, there and um, happy to, to help anytime. Yeah, and um, for those of you who may not be aware, we, Steve will be at our WSA symposium, which is in his... Uh, Backyard at Hailing Island. That's in October seventeenth uh, and eighteenth. And at the minute, it's uh, we, we've got the go ahead. Uh, so if you want to catch up with Steve, there we'll be running some um, amazing workshops with a lot of our trainers. And um, it'd be great to see you there. You can find out all the information on the on the website. So I think um, we've gone way over time, Steve. We always do, but that's great because I, I love listening to this um, your webinars. Um, so. I just want to say from on behalf of WSA, um, amazing, thank you, thank you ever so much for another fascinating webinar and thank you very much to our audience. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. If you've missed some of it, it will be on our uh, YouTube channel. We'll be posting that um, sometime tomorrow um, and it's all the other ones that we've run are on there as well. It's a free resource. Um, next Wednesday, we've got a free uh, webinar also on um, plastics in our oceans so be good to see some of the audience there so from me steve i'd like to say thank you and there's anything you want to add before we sign off no just thank you everyone for joining and uh hope it's been informative and uh yeah i i yeah i'm just so stoked so people so many people are actually wanting and willing to learn and to listen and uh, important people don't get confused you know if you if you get start, if you are getting confused then uh, take a deep breath as i say you can always contact me and i'll, I'll help you however i can uh, but basically, you know, you do have to be your own myth buster. You've got to start. You know, don't believe everything you hear. Ask questions. You know, you know, be confrontational. You know, don't take everything for verbatim. It's really important to in, to, in your learning process. It really is. Yeah, very wise words. Um, okay, so thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks once again, Steve. Um, stay safe, happy paddling, and we hope to see some of you uh, on Wednesday or uh, next Friday. Um, so look out for the information. Okay. So thanks again. Night, everyone. Okay. Good evening. Good morning, wherever you are in the world. Yeah. Have a good weekend. Yeah. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye. -bye.